Well, Shalom Hadavar Nix. Welcome to Hadavar Messianic Ministries and our School of Biblical and Jewish Studies. We're studying the Jewish life of the Messiah, the 2021 edition. We're in lesson 12 and this is session 42. So let's go ahead and review session 41. In session 41, Yeshua taught five parables preparing us for the rapture. Those parables taught us to one, be ready, that is saved, spiritually saved, two, to be watching, that is living a life of faith, and three, to be laboring, that is doing what we can as we wait for the rapture to occur. Then we discuss the judgment of the Gentiles, and I told you that the Kidron Valley is the traditional location of the Valley of Jehoshaphat, the location of the judgment of the Gentiles after the tribulation period. But I don't favor the Kidron Valley. I think there's an alternative view that's better in Zechariah 14, 4 and 5. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in the front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley. Now, I think that's the better option for the Valley of Jehoshaphat. So that half of the valley will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. You will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of my mountains will reach to Azel. Yes, you will flee as you fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord, my God, will come with all the holy ones with him. So I think the valley of Jehoshaphat is probably not the Kidron Valley, but I think it will be this location here. This is an earthquake fault running east to west, directly underneath the Mount of Olives, and this is the lower slopes of the Mount of Olives. So when this earthquake fault opens up very wide and huge, which it will, and splits the Mount of Olives, then I think that will produce the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And here is an aerial view, a satellite view, uh, of the same earthquake fault that runs into the uh, Mount of Olives. Again, I think this is a better option for the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Now, at the, at the judgment of the Gentiles, at the end of the tribulation, there'll be three groups. One group will be called these brothers of mine. These are the Jewish believers that survived the tribulation. The second group will be called the sheep. Now, these are the Gentile believers who survived the tribulation. They'll put, be put on Yeshua's right, and they will have the privilege of entering the Messianic kingdom. But then there'll be the third group, the goats on his left. The goats are the Gentile unbelievers of the kingdom. They'll be put on, uh, unbelievers of the tribulation. They'll be put on Yeshua's left. They will not be allowed to enter the kingdom, but they will receive the death penalty for their rebellion and anti-Semitism. Then we talked a little bit about an application. Of course, a very obvious application, a very obvious theme is to be ready, watching, and laboring. And Yeshua deliberately taught five parables, applying these principles to our lives. We are to be ready, that is, saved, spiritual saved. We are to be watching, living a life of faith. We are to be laboring, that is, striving to make others ready as well. So the question we need to ask ourselves personally is, am I ready? Am I saved? Have I, have I uh, given a, uh, undergone a spiritual transaction of faith, a genuine sp spiritual transaction of faith, trusting Yeshua as my Savior? Secondly, if I am saved, am I watching? Am I living the faith life? And third, am I laboring? Am I striving to bring others into the mystery form of the kingdom of God? Striving to see that others are made ready for the messianic kingdom when it is instituted. So I ask you to write down one point, one of those three points, which is most meaningful to your life today. Are you ready? Are you watching? Are you laboring? And then go to a plan of action. Ask yourself, how can I make this point real and practical in my life? Well, then we moved into lesson 12, and lesson 12 started by going over Tuesday of Passion Week. Yeshua and his disciples re-enter Jerusalem, and on their way into Jerusalem, they pass that withered fig tree that Yeshua had cursed. When they got to the temple, the testing of the Lamb of God began. He was tested by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians on four issues, and he passed each test in flying colors. 
And then he began testing his opponents, and he silenced them. He then pointed out the poor widow who gave the legal minimum to the temple for its upkeep, said she was a, an example of love and trust and faith because she gave all she had to live on. Everyone else basically gave out of their surplus. Then he left the temple and went across the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives and began the Olivet Discourse. We also learn that Judas is needed by the religious leaders for three reasons. Number one, to show where Yeshua can be taken apart from the multitudes, not for identification, because the religious leaders, they knew exactly who he was. The Pharisees and Sadducees knew exactly who he was because of his times of teaching on the Temple Mount. So they didn't really need to identify him, but they wanted to take him secretly. So where is Yeshua? apart from the multitudes, so we can take him secretly, because they didn't want the multitudes to rise up in a rebellion against them. They were very afraid of that. Secondly, before the Roman governor could release his cohort, his soldiers, an accusation had to be brought so Rome could indict Yeshua. And so Judas would come before Pontius Pilate with an accusation, and then Pilate would release his soldiers for the arrest. And the third need of Judas is a prosecuting witness at the civil trial. He's not needed for the religious trial. That's no problem there. The religious leaders have their witnesses against him. But he is needed for the civil trial to testify to a charge. This would be a political charge. So Rome could execute Yeshua. See, the, the rabbis and the Sadducees, etc., were dealing with religious charges. And Rome could care less about the Jewish religion. So Judas was needed for this civil, uh, uh, political accusation. Now Judas will succeed in points one and two, but he will not succeed in point three. He will not be there for the civil trial. All right, that brings us to the new material. We're in lesson 12, page five at the top of your outline. And this is section 211, the preparation for the Passover. So we'll start with a little bit of historical background. Let's start one or two weeks prior to the Passover. First of all, all adult males were commanded to appear before the Lord at Passover. This is Deuteronomy 16:16. 16, 16. Three times in a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses at the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now that's also the Feast of Tabernacles. Excuse me, that's also the Feast of Passover because Passover and unleavened bread uh, occur consecutively, one right after another, the two names became conflated, and one means the other. And you'll see that as we go through the text. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Booths, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. So these are the three pilgrim festivals that the Jewish males were expected to come to Jerusalem for, commanded to come to Jerusalem. Unleavened bread, Passover, Weeks, and booze. Now, when the, when the families, and the families were not restricted from coming as well, the men had to come, but their, with their families, it was, it was optional. And so many, many Jewish people came to Jerusalem for the Passover, and it was a joyous time in the days of Messiah. The population of Jerusalem was estimated at 600,000 normally, so that's a pretty good sized town. But the population swelled to an estimated 2 million during the Passover. And so Jewish people came from all over the Middle East and the Mediterranean world. And we have a list, <clears throat> we have a list of those Jewish people, their locations, in Acts chapter 2, verses 8 through 11, right after the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost. And how is it that we each hear them in our own language in which we were born? And here comes that list of countries the Jewish people came from, Parthians, and Medes, and Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own languages, our own tongues, speaking the mighty deeds of God. Okay, so two million people from all over the Mediterranean world. And free lodging was given to all, they were all welcomed, now, some came as early as one or two weeks early to go through a seven-day ritual purification um, ceremonies. 
Now, during this time, the roads and bridges were repaired. Now, here is a drawing of a crew of men repairing a well. Make sure there's enough water for all these pilgrims coming into town. Homes were scrubbed and polished. This is where spring cleaning comes from. And tombs, tombs were whitewashed, painted white to avoid defil defilement. And you see this man, he's um, painting this uh, grave marker so nobody would sit there and picnic, put their lunch on the grave marker <laughs> and therefore defile it. In the background, you can see pilgrims heading for Jerusalem in uh, their ox cart. So preparations were being made for Passover. Now, the fact that the tombs were whitewashed is referred to by Yeshua in Matthew 23, 27 and 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too, outwardly, appear righteousness, righteous to men, but inwardly, you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. So the Pharisees looked awfully good on the outside, but look, God looks on the heart, and inside he found nothing but disease and death. And we should keep that principle in mind for our own lives. We may look great on the outside, but God looks on the inside. He looks on our hearts. All right, now let's move to the final week before Passover, Passion Week, from the 10th of Nisan to the 14th of Nisan. Now, leaven was removed and stored during that final week before Passover, and leaven is a symbol of sin in rabbinic thought and in the New Testament. For example, Encyclopedia Judaica, you find in the article, Leaven in Jewish Thought, leaven is regarded as the symbol of corruption and impurity. There it is, sin. The yeast and the dough is one of the things which prevents us from performing the will of God. And that's a quote from the Talmud. And then this, of course, is picked up by Yeshua. He's, uh, he's very cognizant of this principle and this symbol. Matthew 16, 5 through 12. How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you about bread, but beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Then, ah, then they understood that he did not say, be aware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So here, leaven stands for false teaching. And this is also picked up by Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? So whatever this leaven is, it gets everywhere. Well, let's, des let's describe it. Well, first of all, clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. So there's leaven in our lives that we need to deal with. Why? Because Messiah, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. See, there's no leaven allowed during the Feast of Passover. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast not with old leaven, not with your old ways, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness. There's the sin that leaven stands for here. But with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So leaven is a symbol of sin, malice, wickedness. Um, bad, false teaching, etc. And so the symbol of sin is not even allowed in the Jewish home during the Feast of Passover. And this is the same today with spring cleaning and the removal of leaven. Today, Jewish people undergo a ceremony called the Michirat Chametz. A Jewish man sells his leaven to a Gentile for the eight-day duration of Passover. For instance, a liquor mar merchant might do that because his liquor is, is a made uh, alcoholic through fermentation, through leaven. A baker might do that because he has leaven in his uh, recipes for baking. But then after the Passover, the trusted Gentile friend legally sells the leaven back, sells the whole business back to his Jewish friend. And here is a chametz contract that allows a rabbi to participate in that ceremony, and um, then here's a man signing a chametz contract. And remember, the baker or the, or the whoever would be legally selling his whole bakery to the trusted Gentile for the eight days of Passover. Now there's an article about this on page six of your outline if you've downloaded the outline. All right, then on the evening before Passover, we're in lesson 12, page seven at the top of the page right now in your outline. On Wednesday evening, 
in Yeshua's day, the Bidikat Chametz, the last cleansing ceremony would take place. It begins with a prayer. The ceremony opens with a prayer. Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by the commandments and commanded us to remove the leaven. So then the head of the house takes a lighted candle and he searches the house. It could be with the aid of a chametz kit that he bought at the local uh, synagogue gift shop. A chametz kit consists of a candle, a feather, and a wooden spoon. So he lights that candle, and using that candle, he searches all the nooks and crannies of the house. And mom, mom has left a crumb or two of chametz in a place where it could easily be found. And when it's found, the father uses the feather to sweep the chametz, the bread, the leavened bread, onto a wooden spoon, and they dispose of the chametz in the fire. They burn it all up. And here's an example of uh, leavened bread being burned uh, before Passover. So he's burning up all the chametz, all the leavened bread in his possession. And then there's a concluding prayer to the ceremony. All leaven that is in my possession, that which I have seen, that which I have not seen, be it null, be it accounted as the dust of the earth. Now this ceremony, of course, is all based on scripture. The rabbis applied Zephaniah 1.12 to this ceremony. It will come about at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are stagnant in the spirit, who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good or evil. So the rabbis teach that Zechariah 1.12 illustrated God searching out people's hearts with his holy light, looking for sin. And that's a good application. We should be <clears throat> very diligent to see that our lives are free from sin. We should shine the light of God's word on our hearts on a regular basis every day and uh, look for sin and try to do our best to remove it. All right, Wednesday was a quiet day for Jesus and his disciples. The only one who might have overtaken significant activity on Wednesday would be Judas as he forged his betrayal plans. So this brings us to Thursday, the 14th of Nisan. The location, we're at the bottom of page seven now, is in the Luke account, Luke 22, seven through 13. Then came the first day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So you see how unleavened bread are conflated. Unleavened bread and Passover are conflated here together into one, one uh, festival. Uh, to say the one, the, to say the name of one, basically means to include the other as well. Okay, verse eight. And Yeshua sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us so that we may eat it. They said to him, where do you want us to prepare it? And he said to them, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house that he enters. And you shall say to the owner of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upper room, prepare it there. And they left and found everything just as he had told them and they prepared the Passover. So apparently Yeshua had prearranged the place. And so Peter and John go to make ready the Passover Seder. They're told to follow a man carrying a pitcher of water. This is a significant instruction because this was always a woman's job. So this guy would stand out. They would, he would stand out and he would lead them to the upper room. This might have been Yeshua's way of maintaining secrecy uh, because um, they, the disciples wouldn't know where that room is. They had to follow him. The, the secret would be kept uh, more uh, securely if they followed a man uh, in this manner. So it might have been, it might have been a reason to keep this secret. Anyway, uh, they knew who to follow and he leads them to the upper room. Now you'll get this map on lesson 13. This is a map of the betrayal, the trial, and the crucifixion. So we're beginning here. We're beginning in the upper room. This is on modern Mount Zion. It was just called the Western Hill in Yeshua's day. So this is the modern Mount Zion, the upper room. This is a traditional location. Now, if you have an ESV study Bible, you'll see that they place the upper room here, south of the Temple Mount. Now, I don't know why they do that. I don't know of any information that would place the upper room in this location. If you learn some, email me. I'd be happy to make a correction and uh, get caught up on, the, on a, 
another traditional location. But anyway, if you have the ASV Study Bible, you'll have this alternative location laid out. Now, the man leads them to a large upper room. Now, here's the, an outside of the house, the traditional house of the Last Supper. And if you go inside and up the stairs and turn to your right, this is what you'll see. This is the upper room. Now, the, the architecture there, the, the archways are crusader work. That's crusader work. So at least the roof is not original. I don't know how much of the room um, went back to the first century, but of course the roof does not and the columns do not. That's crusader work. And now if you walk across the room, in between that dark pillar at the far end and the stairway you see to the left and turn around, uh, this would see where you, this is where you had been. You can see the stairway coming up into the upper room. Now the tradition is that this is John Mark's house. Now this is a very interesting location because below the upper room, now we're on page eight of your outline, below the upper room is a synagogue devoted to David's tomb. So if you go down below here, you'll find a synagogue and many times Orthodox Jews praying at this memorial to David's tomb. It's not David's tomb, but it is a memorial to David's tomb. Now in the background, you'll see this niche, this huge niche in the wall. Pay attention to that. Now here's another picture of a woman, an Orthodox woman praying at the memorial. And again, in the background, there's that niche. You'll find out why that niche is important in just a moment. Now the ironic, the ironic thing about this location of David's tomb is that the location is actually a Jewish Christian church building, the very first church building here in Jerusalem, the very first Jewish Christian synagogue or church. Now, how do we know that? Well, archeology span has made some very interesting discoveries. Uh, first of all, here is a diagram of David's tomb and the Church of the Apostles found on Mount Zion. Or again, this is biblical, excuse me, this is modern Mount Zion, not biblical Mount Zion. Well, the archeologists uh, dug around in the room and they located the original first century floor, just a fragment of it. So they knew where the first century floor was. Then they can kept digging and or kept ex, you know, excavating. And then they found the Roman period floor and the Roman period floor contained Judeo-Christian graffiti. So Jewish Christians occupied this room during the first century, during the Roman period. So this was the first Jewish Christian church. But there's more information that helps us. It's that niche. Here's the niche in the original Judeo-Christian synagogue. That niche must be from the first century. Now the important point of this niche is that synagogues are often oriented toward, toward important uh, locations in, in important directions. And this Jew Jewish Christian synagogue is, is oriented toward an important location. Now here is a diagram of the orientation of the Judeo-Christian synagogue. First of all, it's not oriented to the north. So the points of the compass are not the interest of the people who built the synagogue. And it's not oriented toward the side of the temple, which you think would be very important if uh, non-believing Jews, Pharisees, Sadducees, built the synagogue. Instead, this synagogue and this niche are oriented toward the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. They're aimed right at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which helps confirm that this is a Jewish Christian synagogue. Now, let's take a look at our map just to look at it again. First of all, the synagogue is not oriented toward the north. That's not important to the builders of the synagogue. It's not oriented toward the temple. It could have been, but that's not the major emphasis of the builders of this little synagogue. It is, it is oriented instead directly at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is um, well, Golgotha, which is the location of Yeshua's death and burial. So again, this is a Jewish Christian synagogue. The irony is that Orthodox Jews today pray at a place devoted to the memory of King David. And the location is in reality, a location devoted to the worship of David's greater descendant, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah. 
it's a great place to visit. I, I recommend you visit when you go to Jerusalem. All right, this is a very significant Passover, John 13, 1. We're in the top of page 9 now. Now, before the Feast of Passover, Yeshua, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So the time is at hand. He will die during this Passover. Now, prior to this, when people tried to kill him prematurely, the reason given for their failure was, my time has not yet come, or his time had not yet come. But now his time has come. At this Passover, his time has arrived. So this will be the most significant Passover in Jewish history. Well, let's get back to Peter and John and the preparation of the Passover lamb. We're in page nine in the middle of the page on your outline. So first, John and Peter had to prepare the room for the Seder. And then they had to go to the temple with their group's Passover lamb so it could be sacrificed. Then they would return to the house and roast the lamb so that it would be cooked and ready to be eaten by the whole group of disciples that evening. Now note, this is not the official festival sacrifice. Now please note what I'm about to share. This information will become very important when we get to section 233. There were many, many, many sacrifices performed at this time, and it can get confusing. Now, a good resource for you is the temple, its ministry and services, as they were at the time of Christ, by our good old friend, good old Dr. Alfred Edersheim. His work is always just top-notch work. You should uh, pick it up for your library. All right, first of the Passover sacrifices, first, there was the personal Passover sacrifice of the lamb, <clears throat> that would be eaten by the family. Note, the fir this first sacrifice I'm mentioning is called the Pesach. It's called the Passover. This is the sacrifice John and Peter are preparing at about 2.30 in the afternoon. All right, now there's a second sacrifice. The next morning, note, the next morning at 9 a.m., the official Passover festival sacrifice would occur on the 15, uh, 15th of Nisan. This second pa Passover sacrifice is called the Chagigah, or the Passover. It's also called the Passover, so it can get confusing. Which sacrifice are we talking about? So it's important to note that there are two Passover sacrifices, the first on Thursday afternoon of the personal Passover lamb to be eaten by the family, that night, sacrificed on the 14th of Nisan, called the Pesach or the Passover. Secondly, the next morning, 9 o'clock, the official festival Passover lamb was sacrificed, the 15th of Nisan, called the Chagigah, also called the Passover. The Chagigah is the Passover festival peace offering. Now, in addition to these two sacrifices, there was the normal daily, morning, and evening sacrifices, and the Sabbath sacrifices. All right, so this is the day of Passover. It's the 14th of Nisan, 30 AD. We're at less, Lesson 12, page 10 at the top. John and Peter prepare the sacrifice of the personal Passover lamb for each family's meal. Now, you had to sacrifice only at the place appointed by God. Only one place was allowed, Deuteronomy 16, 5, and 6. You are not allowed to sacrifice the Passover any of your towns which the Lord your God is giving you. But at the place where the Lord your God chooses to establish his name, you shall sacrifice the Passover in the evening, at sunset, at the time, at the time that you came out of Egypt. Now, by way of application, the Passover sacrifice could only be sacrificed at one location. And by way of application, the only place appointed by God for salvation is the cross of Messiah, the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. John 14, 6, Yeshua said to them, said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He is the one place, the one sacrifice where our sins can be forgiven. All right, so John and Peter had to go to the temple with the lamb. They bought a lamb. They brought it to the temple. And the priests arranged the men in groups of 10 or 20. And you can see here a couple of groups of men all kneeling down. 
there be one lamb per group, per household. So the disciples would be one group. And Peter, let's assume that this is Peter, Peter would be their representative, or Peter and John, whoever was making the sacrifice. Now the sacrifice then would be killed at a trumpet blast, and the blood would be caught in a bowl called the Mitzrach. And you can see the Mitzrach there. Here's a close-up of a Mitzrach that the Temple Institute has constructed for use in the third temple when it gets built. All right, now the sacrifice would be made, the lamb would be have its throat, throat cut, the blood would flow into the Mitzrach, and then the, the, a bucket brigade of Levites would pass the Mitzrach down the line all the way to the base of the altar, and the blood would be poured out at the base of the altar by Levites who were given that job. Now here's an illustration of Levites dashing the blood. Now this is, <coughs> excuse me, this is a generic picture. It shows one Levite dashing the blood on the two corners, two sides of the altar, and that was required for some sacrifices. And here uh, the Levite is pouring out the blood at the base of the altar, also required by some sacrifices. Now Josephus tells us that at each Passover in the first century, a one quarter of a million lambs were slain. 250,000 lambs each year. Lots of blood. Pl plenty of blood would be spilled. And then the blood had to go somewhere. The blood ran down pipes under the temple and out into the Kidron Valley. And the stream at the bottom of the Kidron Valley would literally run red with blood. And now here's a picture of the priests cleaning up after all the sacrifices. You can see these fellows here are, are squeegeeing the blood, uh, so it would go into the drainage ditches. And notice, uh, according to rabbinic literature, uh, Jewish literature, the priests would serve ankle deep in blood. Ankle deep in blood. 250,000 lambs. And here's a little drainage ditch. This uh, Levite has uncorked, and the blood is flowing down to the Kidron Valley. So what does that tell you about the value of the sacrifice of Messiah? God the Father is willing to illustrate it with the lives of millions upon millions upon millions of lambs over all these years. Yeshua is unique. He is the Passover Lamb of God. Well, today there's no temple and there's no sacrifice and lamb is forbidden by the rabbis until the temple and the sacrifice is reinstated. All right, the second step after the sacrifice is to sing Psalms 113 to 118. That's the Hallel. Psalm 118 is especially strong messianic. Psalm 118, 26. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The great messianic greeting. We're to, we're to greet the Messiah with when he comes. So these psalms are still recited today at Passover in the Haggadah. What's the Haggadah? Well, the Haggadah is the book containing the 19 services of the Passover. This is a very, very popular one. Uh, you run into it all the time by Rabbi Nathan Goldberg, this Passover Haggadah. Here is the, just a, an open page. You can see part of it's in Hebrew and part of it's in English. Again, a very pop popular Haggadah. And here is an ancient Haggadah. I don't know how old it is, but it's got beautiful calligraphy and it's beautifully illustrated. I'm sure it is worth a beautiful amount of money. That's a very nice Passover Haggadah there. Well, the lamb was, be cl was cleaned and skinned, etc., by the Levites. The entrails were removed, etc. And then the parts of the lamb that were cut off were burned on the altar. And so here you can see Papa and his son in the foreground. And they have a bowl containing the parts of the lamb to be burned. And the Levites are taking the bowl up to the altar and, and pouring it out on the flames. And then other Levites are returning, bringing the bowl back to its owner. So after the parts of the lamb were roasted and burned, uh, the lamb is then taken home. The lamb's taken home. Here's Papa and his son taking the lamb home. And then it's, they'd fire up their oven and they'd roast the lamb in their oven, get it prepared for the dinner later that evening. They also had to prepare other items. So Peter and John were busy preparing these items as well. <clears throat> they had to make sure there was a supply of unleavened bread 
at the Passover table, and this is machine-made modern matzah. How do you like all those M's? Machine-made modern matzah. <laughs> very, very uniform in its, um, in its construction. So you can see this is what we have today often. But this is um, handmade matzah, not quite as, as even and uh, symmetrical, but both of them are both kosher for Passover. And then not only unleavened bread had to be available, but wine had to be available, kosher for Passover wine need to be available, and then some bitter herbs, and you could use horseradish, sometimes it's mixed with beet juice, like you see it here, romaine lettuce, uh, horseradish root, uh, you just needed some kind of a bitter herb for the ceremonies. And here's a picture of a modern Seder, I think this household is set up for three. This is a modern Seder all set up for the Passover. See, everything's looking beautiful on the table and ready to go. You can see uh, the, our little Passover Haggadah there, uh, ready for each participant. And here's another table where the, the family has set up the Passover and all its elements very beautifully and very correctly. It's a big job, it's a big job. You know, so Peter and John labored most of the gathering and organizing the items needed for the Seder. And again, like I say, especially for a big group, it's a big job. Now that evening, Yeshua and the others came to the room to participate in the Passover Seder, Seder the celebration. Now we're at the heading on your outline entitled The Room, top of page 13. So please refer to the drawing on your outline sheet and follow along as I describe the room. Now, as they entered the upper room that day, they would have encountered the table prepared for them earlier in the day by John and Peter. <coughs> and Peter. It would be a low eastern table, no more than a foot off the ground, a foot or lower, not three feet like our modern tables. And the guests would be seated around the table, reclining. Now, part of the table would be covered by a tablecloth. This would be the area where the guests would recline and part of the table would be uncovered. This would be the miscellaneous items of the Passover, the bowls, the pitchers, the towels, whatever you needed to um, make sure the meal went on successfully. Then the cushions would be placed around three sides of the Passover table in the shape of a U, like so. And the guests would recline on those cushions, their feet extending away from the table, uh, their left hand propping up their head, their right hand free to partake of the meal. Now here is a round Passover table. They didn't necessarily, necessarily have to be rectangular, uh, but you can see the people uh, around the Passover table. Now don't, don't confuse this with the Roman triclinium. Some commentators feel this is a Roman triclinium. Well, here's a Roman triclinium. One, two, three couches with the guests reclining on the couches. That's not what's happening in the first century in Jerusalem. Here is another Roman triclinium. That's not what's going on. Three couches are not what's going on in, um, in Jerusalem, even though these three couches are placed in the shape of you. <laughs> this is not what's going on in the upper room. So here we can see a better drawing of what was going on in the upper room. You can see that the, the um, participants in the Seder reclined on their left elbow, feet extending away from the table, and the right hand was free to uh, eat the meal. Now here we have our Passover, other Passover room, <coughs> and here's our fellow reclining on his left elbow, right hand free to partake of the meal. And this, this reclining is symbolic of being a free man. Slaves or servants ate standing or sitting, but free men reclined, and here's the servants, of course. They're standing, they may be allowed to sit, but they had to be ready to jump up and serve all the guests at the Passover. Now, in groups of three or more, the master of the group sat between the two most honored guests at the head of the table. <clears throat> so here's the head of the table on the side of the table, and Yeshua is reclining there. He's the master of the group. <clears throat> the most honored guest was reclining above him to his left. That's where Judas is reclining. The second most honored guest is reclining to his right below him. That is where John is, um, is reclining. Then in descending order of importance and honor, the rest of the guests, the rest of the disciples in this case, are seated 
around the table, reclining around the table, till we come to the least important seat, which is the foot of the table. So we have the most important seat is the head of the table with the master, with the two most honored guests to the left and right, <clears throat> and then the least important seat at the foot of the table, and that's where Peter is reclining. And here you can see our round Seder table. Here we have the Papa, the master, he's at the head of the table. And then to his left is the most important guest, the most honored guest. To his right is the second most honored guest. And here's the poor fella at the foot of the table <laughs> down here. And one more illustration. Here we have Yeshua at the head of the table, the master of the Seder, master of the, of the banquet. To his left above him is Judas in the most honored position. To his right below him is John, the second most honored position. And at the foot of the table, the least most honored seat is the apostle Peter. <clears throat> now it could have been over these two seats, the foot of the table and the most honored guest, that the disciples' spirit of competitiveness, rivalry, and contention Surface. So let's look at the, con the controversy. This is Lesson 12, page 14. The strife was about who would be the greatest in the kingdom. Luke 22, 24 through 30. And there arose also a dispute. Here it is. A dispute among them as to which of them was regarded to be the greatest. <laughs> Ego here, huh? And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them. And those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it is not this way with you. But the one who is the greatest among you must become like the youngest and the leader like the servant. For who is greater? The one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? He's speaking of the master here. But I am among you as one who serves. He was the master, he sat at the head of the table, but he acted like one of the servants. You are those who have stood by me in my trials. And just as my father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat and drink in my table, in my kingdom, and you will sit on the thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. All right, like Dr. Alfred Edersheim, I find it consistent with Judas's Judas Iscariot's personality, that he might claim and grab the left-hand seat, the seat of greatest honor. Now, his aggressive claim could easily trigger the controversy that occurred, the dispute that occurred. Judas, what right do you have to claim that seat? Judas, what are you doing over there? Get back here, Judas. Let Yeshua decide who sits there. You know, something like that, who knows? Yeshua then rebukes their spirit of competitiveness, as recorded in Luke 22 there. Now we'll get to this in more detail when we get to section 215. So Judas is to his left, and John, often thought to be the youngest of the disciple, is sitting below him at, his, at the uh, right, right there. That's, uh, this would put um, Yeshua, uh, John in the position to ask the four ritual questions of the Passover Seder. So he's in the second most honored position. And with his back to Yeshua, this would have allowed him to lean back and put his head on Yeshua's breast, as we'll soon see. But let's imagine Peter, stung by the master's rebuke, impulsively moving to the last seat, the seat at the foot of the table. This would be consistent with his impulsive personality. But it's also possible, it's also possible that Jesus assigned everybody their seats. Judas, you sit here. John, you sit here. Peter, you sit over there. But if Yeshua had assigned the uh, disciples their seats, it's not, that can't account for the quarreling that has occurred. That can't account for the quarreling. Now, one more irritation could have added to the controversy, and that was the fact that Jesus had apparently wanted privacy. And so no slave was there to wash the disciples' feet. And the feet were considered the most dishonorable part of the body. The feet walked around in sandals, and the feet stepped in the droppings, and the mud, and the dust, and the dirt, and the, the garbage, and anything else that might have been 
in the street. The street where the, the feet were the dirtiest part of the body, the most dishonorable part of the body. And none of the, of the disciples, with their attitude of pride, humbled himself to do this menial task of washing the feet. You know, they were going to be with Jesus in the kingdom. They weren't slaves. Remember, they were preoccupied with their thoughts of self-importance, who would be the greatest in the kingdom of God. And so with this very reverent beginning, Yeshua is ready to begin his last Passover, the most significant Passover in the history of Israel. Now, the harmony is well done except for the order of the Passover. So we'll move through the Passover in the order found in the harmony. But I want you to turn to Lesson 12, page 15, and the chart of the Passover ceremonies. The correct order are the, of the sections is found in the right-hand column of that chart. So just to know, let you know, we'll be going through the Passover in the order that the, that the harmony has placed it, but the correct order is the order of the sections in the right-hand column, okay? So just to, just to, I'm doing that just to make it a little easier to go through the material. All right, section 212, the beginning of the Passover meal. We start with Luke 22, verse 14. When the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So he's been looking forward to this particular Passover celebration a very unique Passover celebration. It is special. It's the last one for Yeshua until Passover is celebrated in the Messianic, in the Millennial Kingdom. Passover will be one of at least three festivals celebrated in the Messianic Kingdom, Passover, Tabernacles, and Shabbat. Now, there might be others celebrated as well, but at least we know from the text of the Bible that Passover, Tabernacles, and Shabbat will be celebrated during the Kingdom. Now, lo note Luke 22:15. there. Yeshua specifically states he is celebrating Passover. The point, I point this out because some commentators, in trying to reconcile Yeshua's statement about being in the grave three days and three nights with the book of John, they claim that he did not eat the actual Passover. They claim that he had an anticipatory meal. However, verse 15 and other verses that we have looked at a few minutes ago clearly state he was eating the Passover. Now, I'll reconcile Yeshua's statement about three days and three nights with the book of John later. But for now, please note this is a Passover Seder. All right, lesson 12, page 16 in the middle of the page. Section 213, the washing of the disciples' feet. Now, the very first service is offering the cup of thanksgiving. Following the drinking of the first cup, normally you wash your hands in preparation for eating the meal. But what Yeshua did was not normal. John 13, verses 1 through 5. Now before the feast of the Passover, Yeshua, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. Yeshua, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from the supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So rather than Jesus washing his own hands, he washes the feet of the disciples. Jesus rises from his place at the head of the table, and he moves over to the uncovered portion of the table, the, ta the portion of the table con containing the miscellaneous items, the bowls, the pitchers, the towels, etc. He takes off his outer clothes, and he wraps a towel around his waist, and he picks up a pitcher and a bowl, fills the bowl with water, and he continues around the table, and the very first disciple he comes to is the Apostle Peter. And Peter responds. 
He does not like seeing the master doing the work of a servant. He doesn't want Yeshua to degrade himself. John 13, 6 through 10. So he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, Lord, do you wash my feet? Are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do to you, what I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, Never, never shall you wash my feet. You know, I'm not going to let you degrade yourself on my behalf. Don't touch, touch the dishonorable part of my body. Don't act like a servant, you know, on my behalf. Don't dishonor yourself. Yeshua answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Well, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. You know, well, if you're going to do it, Lord, at least wash something honorable. Don't limit yourself to my feet. Wash my hands and my head. Do something honorable. Yeshua said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Now in those days, public bathhouses were utilized, so the bather walked on die, their dirty, dusty roads coming home from the bathhouse, and the ser servant would wash his feet. And again, the feet were, are, were then and are today considered the lowliest part of the body. To wash another's feet is the most humble, menial task. And that's what Yeshua is doing here. He's washing one of his disciples' feet. But he says to them that they are clean all over. When you're bathed, you're clean all over. That's a lesson in salvation. When we're saved, we're bathed all over. But as we walk around in this world, our feet get dirty and need to be washed all the time. And that's a picture of our daily walk. That's a picture of sanctification. Well, how do we wash our feet today? Well, we wash our feet today with 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I call 1 John 1, 9 the believer's wash rag. If we confess, we're cleansed from all, all, all unrighteousness. Remember that, everything. Now, he speaks of Judas's betrayal in verses 11 and verse 18. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. And then in verse 18, I do not speak to all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. But it is that, it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. So after washing Peter's feet and convincing Peter that this break of tradition was kosher, Jesus now moves around the table, washing the feet of each disciple in turn, one after another, giving individual attention to each disciple. There he goes around the table, going to the more honored disciple, starting with the least honored and going to the more honored, including including Judas. He washes the feet of Judas, the one he knew was betraying him. Quite amazing. Now, in the washing of the feet, he repeated two lessons, Matthew 20, 25 through 28. But Yeshua called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. That's lesson one, number one. If you want to be great, you have to serve like a humble servant. Lesson number two. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The second lesson is the example of the Son of God. So if you want to be great, number one, you got to serve. Number two, just like I, just like me, just like me. All right, let's, let's read John 13, verses 12 through 20. And so when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. 
If I then, the Lord and the teacher, wash your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you, serve one another. I don't think he's talking about literally having to wash your feet. You could do that. But what he's talking about is serve one another as a servant, have a servant spirit. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is the one who sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I'm telling you before it comes to pass so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Receives him who sent me. All right, you're now at lesson 12, page 17 in your outline, and I've provided two articles there for you, one from Encyclopedia, Ju uh, excuse me, one from the Jewish Encyclopedia.com on foot washing, and then I want to share with you a personal experience, a letter I received from a friend who went a mission trip to the Middle East. I don't remember exactly where she went, but she went to the East, and she shared her experience with me in a letter. This was in December of 2004. Uh, when I received this letter. She says, if you ask me what the most impressive thing was for me there, what impacted me the most, then I would say the foot washing on Tuesday night. The ministry's leader gave a teaching on the servanthood and humility of Yeshua, and for the object lesson for the women, he had our team wash the feet of all our women in our small group. It was a very humbling experience not only for the women, but for me as well. The cultural background is that the feet are considered the most unclean part of the body. There it is. <laughs> Same cultural background as in first century Israel. You do not touch the feet, and especially not the sole of the foot. The woman sat in the chair, heads covered, not looking at me, often crying as I knelt before them, washing their feet. Later, I found out that it was very humbling for them that a white person from a higher social and economic stand in life would serve them in such a way and do that for them. The whole time I washed the feet of nearly 30 women, I thought, how lovely are the feet who bring good news. The women walk in flip-flops and some barefoot here at the conference and of course at home in their villages too where the streets and the paths are mostly dirt roads, so the feet get very dirty. These feet walk through the mud and the dirt and whatever else you can think of, but they are carrying the gospel from door to door. They share sewing and literary, literary, literary skills. They teach the Bible to hundreds of women in their villages and beyond. They are prayer warriors, ministering to and serving other women and people around them. It goes on and on. I did not see the dirt on the mud and the mud, but the beauty of those feet. How lovely they were. May God bless you abundantly. A. Beautiful feet. Beautiful feet. All right, well, that brings me to section 214, and I only have a couple of minutes left, so I don't have time to go through section 214. So we will pick it up, we'll pick it up next session with the identification of the betrayer, first part of section 214. Thanks so much for being our students. I'm, this is an amazing section of scripture, isn't it, as we go through the Passover and all that's happening there. I hope it is um, drawing you closer to Yeshua in love, in appreciation, in obedience, and in worship. And I hope the next sections as we continue through the Passover will only bring you closer and more in your love and obedience to him as we go through it. Again, thank you so much for being our, our uh, students. We'll see you next week. Well, next week, we'll see you next session. Lahitra Ode. Lahitra Ode.